There are 126 colleges that could take over the US and only one team will be standing by the end of this video. College football imperialism is back and we're getting right into it with this wheel spin where the first team playing is going to be Penn State. Based on this directional wheel, it looks like they're going to be going to the south, so they'll be attacking Maryland first. And if they win, they'll take all of the Terrapins land, but if they lose, Penn State will lose all of their territory and be eliminated. I'll be buying the team jersey for whoever wins this thing. And with a minute and a half left, Penn State is down by two to Maryland, so they might get knocked out. Out. Drew Aller just took a bad sack there on second down and they're not going to pick up the first. So if they don't get this fourth and inches, they're in a lot of trouble and they don't. Maryland has clearly learned nothing from the Miami game as they are not taking a quarterback knee, but they're going to run out the clock. And we have started imperialism with a huge upset. I mean, Maryland has been good this year, but I just didn't see them knocking out Penn State. But we all love imperialism because any of these 125 teams could win it all. And let's just say the fact that I'm wearing an Arizona jersey proves that to be true. Next up is Nevada and they have been atrocious this year, so I doubt they stand a chance against the Oregon Ducks. But again, technically anything could happen, and it was actually a lot closer than I expected it to be, but Oregon is still going to get the win, and Bo Nix did a pretty good job. The only issue with that is the Ducks' territory is now touching eight different colleges, and if you want your favorite team to have the best shot at winning, you don't want them to expand too soon. JT Daniels and Rice are taking the field next, though, and they'll be going up north, and we'll see what the former five-star can do against Texas A&M. At this point, he's played for like four different colleges, and there's multiple things I can can't believe about this game. First of all, Rice is punting it back to Texas A&M on a fourth and two, and second of all, they are only down by five points with a bit of time left. I think they should have just gone for it, but they're trusting their defense to get three stops, and that's why you save all three of your timeouts, because now it's third and ten, and all they have to do is prevent a first down. He drops back, and he finds Evan Stewart out of bounds, and for how good Stewart is, I'm surprised he couldn't keep his feet in. This is JT Daniels' chance, though, to prove everybody wrong, to prove that he is a good quarterback, and I'm a bit surprised they spiked it on second down, but they're getting close to picking up the first. First, and once again, it comes down to a fourth and two, which they're not going to get. I'm not sure Texas A&M really deserve that win. And if they want to make a deep run in this thing, they're going to have to step up their level of play. We've only seen three teams get eliminated so far, which means we have a long way to go, but that is the beauty of imperialism. My favorite team's rivals, the Cardinals, are playing now, and they've been really good in real life, but we'll see how they do in game. Western Kentucky is never an easy win, and they also have the home field advantage. So it isn't a shock that with a minute and a half left, Louisville's trailing by seven, and we'll see what Jack Plummer can do. He just took down Notre Dame in real life. He's checking it down here, but Jawar Jordan couldn't break free, and Western Kentucky's done a good job of holding him today. It is third and three now. Jack Plummer is dropping back in the pocket. He got like five cent at him, and that is intercepted by the Hilltoppers. That's it. They also don't believe in taking knees, so nobody learned from the Hurricanes, but this run is going to seal the game, and I knew that an upset could happen in this one. I'm hoping that means Kentucky will run the state at some point in this video, but for all I know, we could lose to Western Kentucky as well, and Arizona State's one of those teams I'm not expecting much out of. The Arrows run them just into UNLV instead of UCLA, but I can't remember the last time that they were good at football. And I guess the Rebels are even worse because they are about to lose. It's 4th and 17. They're not going to convert. So the Sun Devils have eliminated them, and that one win alone will almost double the size of their entire territory. But in the grand scheme of things, they're just a speck on this map still. And it's probably going to be a while before we see anybody taking over a large chunk of the U.S. Colorado State might be interesting, though, if this arrow lands the right way. And that is perfect as we're getting a rematch of this rivalry game. With Deion Sanders, the Rocky Mountain showdowns become very entertaining, and it looks like Colorado's gonna win, but they're not gonna pick up the first, so the Rams have a slight chance as they've gotten the ball back, but there's only 24 seconds remaining, and they have no timeout, so they need everything to go perfectly. That throw probably should have been intercepted, and now they're gonna get about 10 to 15 yards, so they could get in Hail Mary range if they go ahead and spike the ball, but the computer's clock management on this game is not the best in the world, and that tackles inbounds, so Colorado fans are able to rejoice in a win, and Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter are pumped up. They're starting out their imperialism run by knocking out one of their rivals, and I'm sure Deion Sanders is happy with that result. Now we're traveling to Georgia State, though, and I'm not even going to act like I know a thing about this team. They're playing Georgia Southern, so this is also probably a rivalry, and apparently this game's called Modern Day Hate. Even if they are low overall teams, this should be an interesting matchup, and we continue to get games that come down to the wire as there's 25 seconds remaining, and Georgia Southern has the ball, but they're down by seven, so they could still technically send this game to overtime or win if they go for the two-point conversion, but they don't pick up the fourth and one, and that means they were just eliminated in front of their home crowd, but if it makes them feel any better, Georgia will probably knock out Georgia State in the near future. I can't guarantee it, considering we have seen a ton of upset runs, and every so often there are some fluky results. Now we're headed to Indiana, and I'd only ever watch these two teams play if it was basketball. Unless you attended one of these two colleges, nobody cares about this rivalry matchup, and that's because with a minute left in the fourth quarter, Indiana has only scored three points, and they just got held on a fourth and seven, so Hudson Carter 
Howard and Purdue are going to defend their homeland while also taking all of the Hoosiers to double their territory size. They're probably still one of the least feared Big Ten teams, and Wyoming might actually be good in this because they've been good in real life, and they're surrounded by a ton of territory that nobody's claimed, so they'll be able to expand for quite a while without having to attack. With one spin, they've become the biggest team in the U.S., and just like life isn't fair, some of these starting positions aren't fair, but if you're someone like Michigan, you're surrounded by a ton of cupcakes, and the first one they'll be facing is Western Michigan. The Wolverines are probably going to pound them, and I doubt this result is going to surprise any of you as it's a 31-point win, which means we're closer to getting a Michigan State versus Michigan rivalry matchup, and that one is always good, so I'm hoping we end up getting that. For now, though, we have Appalachian State headed on the road to the northeast, and if I was a Wake Forest fan, I'd be a little bit concerned. The Mountaineers always give somebody a good game, but I guess today wasn't their day, and they did not make it long in imperialism. That result will double the amount of territory that Wake Forest has, and we've only had a couple upsets so far, like Penn State, Maryland, and Louisville, Western Kentucky. Maybe Ole Miss could be the next team to lose a game they should win, though, and I think this arrow is just going to hit Memphis. The only thing they got going for themselves is their jerseys, but apparently NCAA football considers this a rivalry game, and I guess it's because Memphis is on the southern Tennessee border, which would end up touching Mississippi, but I was not expecting them to actually be in this game. Seth Hennigan throws for the first, and I swear, this kid has always given other teams issues in any of my dynasties and in any of these imperialisms. That one was a dart over the middle, and he's going to take it to the end zone. So Memphis just went up on Ole Miss, and Jackson Dart might actually be eliminated. If he continues to make passes like that, it's a guarantee, and why are they running the football? I mean, it worked in picking up about 10 yards, but they have got to start passing it, and they might be able to get in field goal range, which would send this game to overtime. A lot of time in the pocket back there, and he is going to get out of bounds, but he cut that a lot closer than I thought he would, and they're just going with the Hail Mary, which is going to be intercepted, so Memphis has officially upset Ole Miss, and I guess it's also a rivalry win for them. Of all of the SEC schools, I didn't think they would be the first to be eliminated, but Memphis was able to shock the world, and that shows how important home field advantage is in imperialism. UTEP isn't going to have it in this situation, and they're going to be headed up to New Mexico, but it's going to take a lot to get excited for this matchup. The Lobos come in at a shocking 67 overall, and if they're able to defend their territory, I'll give credit to them, but being down 10 with 23 seconds left, I don't think it's possible to come back, and they're not able to beat the Miners, which is something you shouldn't want to do anyways. All right, back to the wheel, and this time it is going to land on Old Dominion, so we're just getting the best matchups possible that we could see, and I think they might actually be able to beat Virginia. The Cavaliers have looked terrible in real life, but if they can get a stop on this two-point conversion, they should hold on to win this game, and Old Dominion has no choice but to go for the onside kick, which is recovered by the Cavaliers. 5-7 Paris Jones had to carry them, and we'll see how Virginia does as this imperialism goes on. Up next, on the wheel, we are going to see Arkansas play, and the Razorbacks are a lot better on paper than how they perform in real life. Because of that, they should take down Tulsa, but it's a road game for them, so anything could happen. Nothing's more entertaining than a game that hasn't had a single touchdown, and here in the fourth quarter, we're still not getting it. It's hard to believe that Tulsa still has a slight chance, but if they can't pick up this fourth and 19, it is all going to be over, and they are not going to do so. There is another interception. Arkansas did play well defensively, but you'd think with 96 overall halfback Raheem Sanders, they would have scored a bit more. A win is a win, though, so Razorback fans can appreciate that. And Syracuse has one of the best positions, but they're being forced into a game early. Actually, after taking another look at the map, I take that back. And if you've noticed, there are a few FBS schools missing, but that's because they're not in college football revamped. Temple is, though, and they're going to be taking the field going to the northeast, which means if we just scroll down a little bit, you'll see they're taking on Army. It might not be an interesting matchup, but it's an even one. And Army isn't used to having to throw the ball, but they could end up winning this game with a couple good passes. They're down by five with about 30 seconds left, so they need to pick up another 45 yards to score, but they continue to get closer, and on second and three, their quarterback's going to take the check down, and the clock does stop on first downs, but they're still spiking it, and they need to go ahead and hike it. They just burned off precious time that they're going to wish they had back. On the four verticals, though, they dropped the pass, and if he could have just held onto this ball, he would have taken that to the house. I have a hard time believing that they're going to get a better look than that one was, but they beat the Temple defense over the top again, and he falls down short. I thought he stretched his way in, but now they need to spike it with four seconds left. Three, two, why are you audibling? And Army's quarterback is getting this way too close. Mr. Bryson Daly has no time management, but he hands it off, and Army has won on the final play. That was an amazing ending, knocking out Temple, and defending your home territory like that has to feel good. From an entertaining perspective, I'm very happy with how that game turned out, and I will continue to root for Army in all of their future matchups. For now, though, we're headed to Georgia, where the number one team is going to play, and like I said, eventually Georgia State's going to be in some trouble. They don't size up with the Bulldogs very well, but they have the home field advantage, and believe it or not, at one point, they were up 14-3, to but now they're 
they're down by three and they're hoping that they can go down the field in 90 seconds to get their win. The quarterback escapes the pressure, but Darren Granger only got one yard and then he spiked the ball. Now they're handing it off and that puts the Panthers in a fourth and seven situation against a tough Bulldog defense, which they won't get. I got to give them props for putting up a fight, but Dejon Edwards got Georgia the win and Carson Beck's going to need to improve if they're going to go far. That result leaves us with just two teams remaining in Georgia and the Yellow Jackets have almost no territory. I'm going to safely assume that they just want to avoid being landed on by the wheel and Boston College always makes it far because of their starting spot, but this time they're already touching two different colleges and that's never happened this early on before, so they might not make a deep run. Kansas State is in the middle of everything though, so they're going to have to play somebody and this is a matchup that just happened in real life. Oklahoma State won it 29 to 10, but the Wildcats have a lead with about 75 seconds remaining and Oklahoma State has to score on this drive, but they're still 71 yards away from the end zone and they need a touchdown, so they have a lot of work to do, but this is a big play and Alan Bowman made a great throw there. Now on this one, he's going to just take his check down, but if you're able to get out of bounds, that's a great decision. Not so much with a run though, and it's a good thing that up to that point, they still had all three of their timeouts remaining. Now they're going to get the first down and I could see this one going to overtime, but they don't want to score too quickly. They've only gotten 14, so I wasn't sure if they'd be able to work it down the field this easily, but the Kansas State defense is gassed and there's 20 seconds remaining now. It is third and seven. They are not going to get the first, so maybe the Wildcats do hold strong on fourth and three. They take the check down again and he fights, which was enough to keep the drive alive, but they have to score on the final play and they do. We have made it to overtime where Oklahoma State gets the ball first and Ollie Gordon is off to the races for a touchdown. Kansas State's offense has completely stalled out. They're on a third and 13 now and this one's going to go over the head of his receiver. So Will Howard had a chance, but he just was a bit off target like Devin Leary has been for Kentucky and on fourth and 13, they didn't do a thing. I don't know what that play call was, but Kansas State has lost again and it was almost the same score that Oklahoma State won by in real life. If you're a Kansas State fan, there's not too much to be happy about right now, but they had that game in their hands and their defense just decided to choke. UTEP is taking the field for the second time though, and they're going up against Arizona, which is the jersey I'm wearing. It's a Rob Gronkowski one from the throwback imperialism video, and I'm kind of shocked that with about 50 seconds left, UTEP is only down by six. This is the same Wildcat roster that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Caleb Williams and USC in real life, but they just got a massive sack, and I'd assume that would kill any momentum the Miners will have. They're going for a deep shot though, and no one on Arizona is over there. That had to have been cover two. And now we have ourselves a ball game as there's still 20 seconds left. Hardison's just going to throw it to this check down who gets the first. And after spiking the ball, they are setting up to score. He is going to get the throw out and it's dropped. But honestly, that was a 500 IQ play by the wide receiver. If he held onto it, he would have gone down in bounds and the clock would run. But they just handed it off up the middle. They're going to get one final snap off. It's fourth and goal. It all comes down to the final play and he's just holding onto the ball too long. I thought the miners were going to shock the world, but Arizona held on in the end and what an unfortunate result that is because I am always going to root for the upset and I think that makes Arizona tied with Wyoming for the biggest territory in the United States. Obviously out west it's a lot easier for teams to accumulate land faster and eastern Michigan's not in that position. They're going to be stuck going to the south which means they are in a ton of trouble. It would be awesome if they could shock the world at the big house and I gotta say with three minutes left they've kept it a lot closer than I thought it would be but they still have to score a touchdown get a stop and score another one so they have a long way to go and if the Wolverines got a goal line hold here, that would be crushing, but it's looking more and more likely. It's fourth and goal, so they have to get in on this down, and they're not gonna. So it's no surprise that the Wolverines are gonna hold on, and Michigan continues to take over the state. I know I say it for almost every imperialism, but we've had a ton of chaos so far, and it feels like it's on pace to be one of the best ones we've ever had, but we got a long way to go before we'd know that, and Wake Forest has already defended their territory once against Appalachian State, so I thought they'd do the same against Charlotte, but they're about to go down, and they're gonna need to get at least a field goal to force it to overtime. This would be another upset if the 49ers defense is able to hold on in the end, but Mitch Griffiths has been carving it up. They're already inside Charlotte's 25, and on third and four, he's just going to try to escape the pocket but get sacked. So I guess we are going to overtime, which I didn't expect. On Wake Forest's first drive on third and four, they went with the halfback screen, but Charlotte was ready for it, and they missed two tackles. So they had an opportunity to get the Demon Deacons off the field, but they weren't able to do it. And I'm starting to feel like the upset isn't going to happen, but that was a massive goal line hold and Charlotte will be able to win it with a touchdown. This is a drive they need to have success on but it's already third and eight and that was a laser from Jalen Jones to pick it up but he's not getting far here. They just haven't been able to get anything going though and that is almost an interception so this game is still going on and of course now when they need it the most their halfback is able to throw for a touchdown pass. Just for giving that up Wake Forest deserves to lose and after some awful play calling it is fourth and 13 where they're not going to get it. Mitch Griffiths has gotten his team
team eliminated, and if Charlotte wins again, I promise I'll change their logo to their updated one. I don't know why I've always used the outdated one, but I didn't expect them to win, and we're finally seeing a Florida team that's going to take the field. It's UCF versus FAU, so it's nothing crazy, but since one of these schools is now in the Big 12, if they lose, it's an upset, and the Knights must have come prepared because this one was never much of a contest. FAU has already been knocked out, and we are down to just 105 teams remaining, so we're getting close to 100, and what are the odds that Arkansas has to play in another game already? This time, they're battling for the rest of their state, and we'll see if the Red Wolves can put up a fight. Well, it looks like they can definitely do that, because if they can finish off this drive with a touchdown, they're going up by two possessions, but the Razorbacks' defense held strong in the end, and now KJ Jefferson has about two minutes to get his team a touchdown, which would get them the win. All I'm gonna say is they should not be in this position, but I'm not surprised by it, and I'm sure their fans are sick of them underperforming, but now they seem to be moving the ball, and if it's this easy for them, I don't know how they only have 14 points in the entire game. If you can clutch up in the end, though, that's all that really matters, and KJ Jefferson throws his fifth straight completion, so Arkansas State's defense needs to show at least a little bit of resistance, and there it is. Third and six now, and what is KJ Jefferson doing? I don't know who he was throwing to, but now they have to convert. If they don't get six yards, it's all over. He throws it on the run into an interception, and he is lost. Arkansas State has pulled off the massive upset, and I still don't know what I just witnessed from KJ Jefferson. I'm sure that the Red Wolves are going to enjoy this, and right now they have a respectable amount of territory. Like Army, they're another upset team that we can root for as the video goes on, but there's another team I'd like to see have success, USF, and I highly doubt that's happening against Miami. Maybe if this one was being played in Tampa, we'd have a chance. And it looks like the Hurricanes have not learned from their own mistake as they're running it. They had the win sealed, but all they had to do was take a QB kneel, and at least I got some enjoyment out of my city's team losing. We did keep it close with Alabama in real life, which was awesome, and Ohio has a ton of teams in it, so I'm surprised it took this long to play there. This one is most likely going to be a bloodbath, especially since the Buckeyes get to host it, and it's definitely a brutal way to go out, but Ohio State's a really solid team, so being able to hang 21 on them is an accomplishment in itself. What I'd really love is if we could get a Notre Dame-Ohio State rematch, but Wisconsin isn't going to get us that as they're a bit far up, and they're going to be taking on Minnesota. Braylon Allen is going to need to have a massive game, and I'm a bit surprised that at home, Minnesota has only put up 14. They're technically not out of it if they're able to recover this onside kick, and they did, but time is ticking down fast. They would have to score a touchdown almost immediately, and they're running it. For that situation, that was definitely an odd play calling choice, but Wisconsin is now one of the bigger teams on the map, and if your team survives this next round, they're going to make the top 100. LSU has been landed on, so they're going to probably beat down on somebody, and I think we all know what's about to happen. It was a lot closer than I thought it would be, but in the end, Noah Kane had three touchdowns, and that was enough for the Tigers to take over all of their territory, which means they're just one of the 100 teams that has made it into the top 100. Since most colleges haven't even played a game yet, I guess that's not a big accomplishment, but now we get to see the Heisman winner play for the first time, and Fresno State has a pretty solid team, so this isn't a guaranteed win for the Trojans, but for the first time, USC's defense decided to show up, and they've just blown out the Bulldogs. That was pretty disappointing considering that I thought Fresno State had a chance, and if the Trojans continue to play like that, they're going to be a problem for every team. Wisconsin's a program that's already had to play once, and technically the closest thing to that arrow is North Dakota, so the Badgers have gotten even bigger, and they don't have the best spot, but they are far away from a lot of different colleges. I'm excited though because the wheel just landed on Charlotte and they're going to the north, which means we're going to see if they can beat another ACC school. If they win this, I'll update their logo, but I have a feeling that they're going to struggle on the road, and they've done their best against Virginia Tech, but it's impossible for them to win on the final play of the game. So after only putting up seven points, they have been eliminated. And that's unfortunate, but there are still plenty more upsets to come. Depending on where this wheel lands, Akron could be one of them, but I don't see them taking down Ohio State. And the Buckeyes obliterated them, beating them by 28. Travion Henderson's just really hard to stop. And assuming Ohio State continues to beat up on all of these Mac schools, the entire state is going to turn into a sea of red. Cincinnati's the only team I could see pulling it off, but they haven't been great this year. And now we get to see what Rutgers can do in imperialism. They're traveling to Army, so this should be a good warm-up for them, but we've already seen the Black Knights put out Temple, and just like that game, it looks like this one is going to come down to the wire, but if Rutgers was smart, they'd chew the clock, and I can't believe Army didn't call a timeout. Now it's just under 30 seconds. Gavin Wimsett picks up the first, but they left chew clock on, and it's going to overtime. Rutgers has worse time management than Miami, and I cannot believe that they just ran down the clock and didn't kick a field goal. They are going to score, though, so to respond back, the Black Knights have to score one as well, and it's not looking too good for them. After losing a few more yards on their next play, it's fourth and goal, and they are not going to get it, so Army isn't going to take down Rutgers, and the Scarlet Knights
rights mistake isn't going to come back to bite them. After that mistake to end regulation, we all know that they're very fortunate to come away with the win, and in a matter of just a few games, we've lost both Charlotte and Army. That does make me a bit sad because I was rooting for some upsets, but now we have to focus on this because two ACC schools are playing, and if Boston College loses, this would be the earliest they've ever been put out. With about two minutes remaining, Syracuse is up by one point, and if they can pick up this third and four, they'll be able to seal the win. They're going to take the drag underneath and get out of bounds, but the Eagles have no timeouts remaining, so they could take three knees. Why are they trying to score right now? It's like nobody has ever learned from Miami. I've said it like five times already, but we just continue to see teams making time management mistakes, and Boston College should just let Syracuse get into the end zone, so I don't know what they're doing. They tried to stop him, but he eventually did get in, and now the Eagles have 52 seconds to potentially send it to overtime if they're able to tie it up, but it was almost picked already, and there's a reason at this point in the game, they only have 13 points. Castellanos just threw for a nine-yard completion, though, and on third and one, he is throwing it deep again. This time, it is knocked away, but Syracuse's corners cannot hold on to it, and there's a reason they're on the defensive side of the ball instead of the offensive side of the ball. They're giving up the first, and I cannot believe the Eagles still have a chance in this game. They're dropping back here. About 20 seconds left now. That's going to hurt because time would end up running out on them, and this is the earliest we've ever seen them put out. Syracuse now has the opportunity to be the team that takes over the Northeast, especially since the only teams around them right now are Rutgers and Buffalo. On to the next, though. We are back to the wheel spin, and this one is going to Texas State. So I'm not going to act like I know anybody on the team, but they're going to have to go to the Southwest, and they've just barely avoided playing Texas. Eventually, one of these two teams will probably run into the Longhorns, and former Auburn quarterback TJ Finley has 19 seconds to get his team into field goal range, but it's not going to happen. That one inbounds check down is going to get the clock down to five seconds, and it seems like UTSA is going to defend their home field advantage with this final sack. This win doesn't really add too much to their territory, but now that they're touching four different bigger schools, they have some tough matchups coming up, and that wheel spin just landed on Marshall, who is headed to the north. They're going to be battling it out for the state of West Virginia, and if the Mountaineers can't win this, their fall as a program will continue. By the way that they played, you can tell they didn't want that to happen, and halfback CJ Donaldson is a monster. He's the only player giving West Virginia fans any hope, but now the entire state is theirs, and with this next spin, we are headed back to Texas. This could end up giving us a very good matchup depending on where the arrow lands, and Baylor wasn't able to avoid the Longhorns. They are defending their own territory, so we'll see how they do, and I cannot believe that with three minutes left, this is what the score is. Texas is still down by two possessions, and they have to start going for onside kicks, which they're not going to recover, so you'd expect Baylor to run out the clock, but instead they're passing, and that is going to turn into a touchdown. I don't know why they would ever throw this ball, but that was an incredible catch, and I cannot believe how well Blake Shapin just played. I can promise you, Texas fans fans are not going to be happy about this one. And now the state's wide open for any of these teams to take it over. Obviously, they were probably one of the biggest favorites to win the entire thing. And hopefully we can continue to get many upsets. I love it. And Troy versus Florida State is a chance for another one. But I just can't imagine we'd get that lucky back to back. The Seminoles literally stomped them winning 44 to 14. And you best believe that Jordan Travis and Trey Benson both played pretty well. With all these bigger programs starting to touch though, this Southeast region could get interesting quick. And I I can't wait to see what happens in some of those games, but for now, we are going to have to head back up north because Rutgers is trying to claim more territory, and they're very fortunate that that arrow is going to avoid Syracuse. Eventually, I'm sure they'll play, but at least for now, they are safe, and Cincinnati is one of the only teams in Ohio that could take down the Buckeyes, but I highly doubt they wanted to play them in their first matchup. Ohio State's hosted all three of the games they've been in, and I think they've just beaten Cincinnati worse than any of the MAC schools. What an embarrassing result for the Bearcats, but like I said last time, Travion Henderson is really good, and he's going to run through this entire state. There's still four other MAC schools left in it that haven't been put out yet, and speaking of smaller programs, now we're going to see what James Madison can do, and I've been very impressed with what they've done since they've come up to the FBS level, but unfortunately for them, they have to attack West Virginia, and I guess that's not a bad thing, as they are up by 11 and about to go up by even more. There's two minutes left, and on third and one, they're not going to pick it up, but they kicked a field goal, and West Virginia is trying their hardest to come back, but there's only a minute remaining and they only have one timeout, so the odds are not in their favor. James Madison is undefeated in real life, so I'm not sure if I can even call this one an upset, but like I said, since coming to the FBS level, they've always impressed, and Kalen Black had a great game. If they weren't surrounded by so many bigger schools, I could see them making a deep run, and if your team gets eliminated and you need an underdog to root for, I'd say go for them. We're finally going back out west, though, as BYU is taking the field, and they're challenging Arizona State, who's already won one. There's no telling who's going to come out on top of this matchup, but apparently the Sun Devils just couldn't
couldn't keep up with BYU. So now the Cougars have a pretty decent chunk of territory, but it still doesn't stack up compared to some of these other schools. Since I'm repping the Arizona jersey, I guess it's nice to see Arizona State get eliminated, but now all of our attention has to focus on Drake May at North Carolina, because they're one of the colleges that could very well win this entire thing, but at the same time, they could also fail to beat Virginia Tech on the road. It looks like they've come out performing well, though, as they have a 19-point lead, and surprisingly, Drake May wasn't the best, so Omari and Hampton had to carry. The Tar Heels just took over a sizable chunk, though, and that means they now have like 10 different colleges bordering them, which will probably lead to them getting attacked more, but we're headed to Toledo, and I feel bad for every team in this state. They just keep getting matched up against the Buckeyes, and none of the games have been close, including the Cincinnati one. This time, it was Kyle McCord that dominated, and if he's also starting to figure things out, the entire country's in a ton of trouble. I hate to admit it, but right now, the Buckeyes are looking like the clear favorites, and LSU has had a rough start to their season in real life, but they have a chance to redeem themselves in imperialism, and we'll see how well they do attacking the Cougars. Well, I wasn't expecting this, but it is a close game with a minute and a half remaining, and if Houston can drive down the field, score a touchdown, and the two-point conversion, they'll be able to send this game to overtime, but Donovan Smith is having trouble in the pocket, and now they're on a third and 16, where they need to pick up at least a chunk of it here, which they do. However, if you notice, the backup quarterback is now in the game because Donovan Smith got injured on the sack, and this guy's getting no time back there either as he's forced to take a check down, which means it is now third and 20. They continue to just lose yards on the halfback screen. They are going to get a few, but there's a reason they only have 13 points on the day, and this is their fourth and 15 play to stay in it. I'm not sure what he's doing back there, but that's it. LSU survives getting another win, and they've started to expand their territory into the Texas area. That entire southeast region is going to be so interesting to see what happens, but for now at least, we're headed up to Oregon where things might get a bit crazy. They could have played their rivals, but instead they get the take on Cal, and this is the last time I can consider this a Pac-12 matchup. If anybody was going to blow out anybody, I thought it would be the other way around, but Oregon didn't come to play, and Bo Nix went back to his Auburn form as he has really struggled today. Sam Jackson the fifth even threw three interceptions, but Jade not just played that well, and he single-handedly just got his team a ton of land, which gives the Golden Bears one of the top five largest territories in the country. If they can take down Oregon, they should be able to compete with anybody, and San Jose State is near them, but I don't think they're able to attack them. That's because somebody like Stanford standing in the way, and these teams are pretty even on paper. Considering how bad the Cardinal have been, I am surprised that they have a lead, but that was a terrible play call, and with no timeouts, I cannot imagine why you would ever call a halfback draw in that situation or catch that football. They're most likely not even going to get a final snap off, and that's one that you just have to go ahead and knock to the ground. I guess Stanford was the better team all along, and we're starting to fly through teams in the West, but there's still plenty of them left in the East. Hawaii's up next, though, and there's a plethora of teams they could attack, but for the time being, it's just going to be Arizona, and they're trying to make their way to mainland USA, but they've only been able to put up five points on the Wildcats, and on this final fourth and ten, they're not going to get it. It's a shame that they weren't able to make any sort of run, and now I have to remember to change the color of the islands every time someone takes this territory. I've forgotten about it in multiple imperialisms now, so my goal is to not do it this time, and we're headed to Central Michigan, who's the most northern team in the state. Thankfully, they're going to be attacking to the south, and if they beat Michigan State, that would be a massive shock, as they were only able to put up seven points on the Spartans throughout the entire game. Well, there's only two teams left in Michigan now, and you'd probably assume that the Wolverines would be the one that eventually takes it all, but we've seen some wild things happen in imperialism, and Ohio State is headed to the northwest. That's actually going to get Michigan playing in this big rivalry, and this early into imperialism, this matchup is insane. With three minutes remaining, Ohio State is down by two on third and three. They're going to pick it up with Kyle McCord, though, and I thought this drive would result in a touchdown, but they're now on another third down, where they got very close to picking it up, but it's fourth and three. They go with the halfback screen. Travion Henderson is going to get it, and the Buckeyes' hopes continue to stay alive. They need to keep moving it down the field, and if I'm Kyle McCord, I'm going to slow the game down and make this the final possession. After getting hit like this, though, I doubt much is going to be running through his head, and this is the best way this rivalry game could end. Third and six. Kyle McCord has a lot of time, and he misses the pass, so the junior needs to clutch up here. You have somebody like Marvin Harrison Jr. on the field, but he finds Cade Stover instead, and that leaves J.J. McCarthy with a minute to get his team in field goal range. They went to Blake Corm there, and they were able to pick up a few. They're going to do the same on this one, and he is not going to get tackled. He will get the first, so they're continuing to stay on pace to get at least three, but these checkdowns might hurt them. It leads to them wasting a down spiking the ball, and I don't understand why they do that or run a halfback draw. It is fourth down. Now there's 32 seconds remaining, and J.J. McCarthy's just going to throw it into the ground, so Ohio State has taken down Michigan at the big house, and like I said, right now they are looking like the favorites to win it all. They're only hurting themselves by expanding this much, but they're good enough to where I don't think it'll matter, because they probably have an overall advantage over almost every team on this game, and let's see what coach
Coastal Carolina can do at NC State. I would have preferred if they got to host this since they play on a teal field, but we're not going to get to see it since they weren't able to keep it close with NC State, and that's a bit unfortunate, but it was also expected. As you can see, a majority of the teams remaining are in this region, so preferably this wheel needs to continue to get us matchups in the southeast area, and Western Kentucky has been landed on. This arrow is pointed to the south, though, so instead of facing my Wildcats, they're going up against Vanderbilt, and they're actually favored to win this one, but with a minute remaining, Vanderbilt has the ball on a fourth and four, and they are not going to convert it, so the Hilltoppers are going to have a chance to go down the field and get a field goal of their own, and I don't know why they've taken the clock down to just 22 seconds remaining, but they might be going for overtime, but I guess not since they used one of their final two timeouts on third and three. They are not going to pick it up, though. It's intercepted, and of course, we made it to overtime where Western Kentucky actually scored on their first possession. Now Vanderbilt needs to do the same, and we'll see if the Hilltopper defense can hold strong because it's already third and six, but I'm not going to lie. I am rooting for AJ Swan here because just a couple of days ago, he sent me a picture of him watching one of my videos, and they're going to get the first. Ever since I DM'd 100 college players for that one video, a lot more players have reached out, and it's just crazy to see what YouTube's been able to do for me, but I'll be forever grateful for it, and here on third and 10, they are just going to take a dump off. So after three rough plays, it's fourth and nine, and they ran it instead of passing. Vanderbilt did not deserve to beat Western Kentucky, and Austin Reed had himself a pretty solid day. I'm honestly worried that if my Wildcats have to play them, we're going to get upset as well, because the Hilltoppers have already taken down two different Power 5 opponents opponents, and they really just got landed on again, this time going to the Northwest. That means it's going to be them versus Purdue, and once again, this is a very winnable game. However, with a minute remaining, they're down by 11, so I think their run is going to end here. And on fourth and one, Purdue needs to get a stop, but they're not going to. So Western Kentucky isn't out of it just yet. On the two-point conversion, they're going to get it. And imagine the scenes if they recover this onside kick, but they're not going to. And even if Purdue doesn't get a first down, they can pretty much run out the rest of the clock, but they're going to have to hand it off here, and at least they made the smart decision. I take back what I said though because they're attempting the long field goal and it's not going to go the distance, which means they're giving Western Kentucky a shot at the Hail Mary and I don't understand this decision. The ball is in the air. Austin Reed got it to about the 10 and it's intercepted. It would have been very funny if Purdue lost on that final play, but instead they're going to knock out the Hilltoppers. So that's unfortunate, but the final team remaining in Kentucky is my Wildcats and Kent State's another team that might have to play the Buckeyes. They have lucked out getting matched up against Pitt instead, but they're still going to struggle to survive in a game like this, and Pitt was just able to outplay them on every single level. The Panthers are going to take a little piece of Ohio, and we're back to the wheel where this time it is going to land on Notre Dame. This could be very interesting depending on where the arrow wheel takes us, and yes, we are getting the rematch that came down to the final play. This is another one that's just going to be a really good game, and I'm stunned that with two minutes remaining, Ohio State's only put up five points, but Kyle McCord has been off today, and if they don't get this fourth and ten, it's all over, but they're going to just convert it, so they're driving and comeback hopes have stayed alive for a little bit longer, and on this play, it's going to go for a touchdown. It might be a little too late, but we'll see what happens on the two-point conversion, as that is very important. Kyle McCord's going to try to run around and float it, but it's not getting where it needs to be. So even if they stop Notre Dame, they're still going to be behind by two possessions since they're down by nine. And I'm surprised the Buckeyes played this poorly at home, but they're not going to get the onside kick after scoring another touchdown. So that officially seals the win for Notre Dame. And because they expanded a little bit too quickly into imperialism, they're not going to make the cut of being one of the last 75 teams standing. We're getting closer and closer to approaching the halfway point of imperialism, and I'll be interested to see what Florida State does in their next matchup. It's on the road at Georgia, so it's another huge battle, and so many different contenders are getting eliminated early on, with Georgia seeming like they're the next one out as they've only put up 10 points on the Seminoles. They're definitely the biggest favorites, and they're about to lose considering they're on a third and 19, which they are going to convert on, but even if they score a touchdown, they're still going to have to recover the onside kick, and it's taken Carson Beck way too long to get things going, but he's also learning as a young QB. Just in case something wild happens, though, I'm going to continue to spectate, and on fourth and goal, Florida State could seal it with one more stop, which they are going to get. Jordan Travis just got his team a massive win, and this type of chaos is exactly why we love college football imperialism. Back to the wheel we go, and this time it is going to hit us with a Navy matchup, and since Army's already out, they could be the next military school to go. They have to play at Maryland, which won't be easy, and maybe their style of play can help them keep it close, but evidently not as they were only able to score three total points on the Terrapins while Talia Tagovailoa went out and dotted up. Of course, we all expected that to happen though, and the only military school still remaining is going to be Air Force. Kentucky just got landed on though, so my favorite team's about to play, and why does our first game have to be at North Carolina? I need something to lift my spirits after that blowout loss to Georgia, but with a minute 19 left, we are trailing by six and Devin Leary's struggling. Like in real life, he's had accuracy issues all day and we need him to clutch up on the 
drive, but he's fumbling the football there. And thankfully we were able to pick it up, but this has been hard to watch on third and 10 though. We are going to get it and our hopes are going to stay alive for the time being because of Barry and Brown, but that's going to be intercepted and Drake May has eliminated my Wildcats. It hurts a bit, but at least I expected that to happen. And there are no longer any teams remaining in the state of Kentucky. I know we only have three colleges, but normally one of them at least lasts for quite a while. And this is a Buffalo football team that doesn't play in the NFL. They're the Bulls, but they're not great. And Syracuse will probably beat them, especially since it's taking place in the Carrier Dome. Well, I take that back. With a minute 38 left, Syracuse is down by 12 and they just threw a pick. So Garrett Schrader has choked this game. And I don't know what's going on with the lighting inside the dome, but it's very bright. The Orange would get the ball back and score a touchdown, but they won't get the onside kick. So that is going to officially seal things. And it took a while, but a Mac school has finally found some success, and if they play their cards right, they could run the entire Northeast. There's no super teams up there when you're facing off against colleges like Rutgers, and Louisiana Monroe has been known in the past for being terrible, so we'll see what they do against Arkansas State, who was able to take down Arkansas earlier on in imperialism. Well, Louisiana Monroe is putting up a fight. They're only down by four with a minute and a half left, and I know their quarterback just took a terrible sack there. It's third and 13, and he's going to throw an interception. You know what? I probably shouldn't have even jumped in. They are just performing terribly now that I'm starting to watch, and Arkansas State is celebrating all over them. This Red Wolves team has been pretty enjoyable to keep up with, and for all we know, they could make a run to be one of the final few teams remaining. Oklahoma State's coming off a win against Kansas State earlier on, but the arrow has directed them right towards our underdog favorite, and they're playing back-to-back -back games on limited rest. They've still been able to keep it close, though, as they're only down by three with about 90 seconds left, and this running back is tough. Ryan Sneed was able to turn something for nothing on third and one. They're gonna go back to him, though, and he gets the first down. And as long as they keep their drive alive, I guess that's all that matters, but they should probably pass. And I don't mean in throwing it straight to the ground, because now you've wasted a down and it would have been much better to just burn off a few extra seconds. They're going to pick up another first though. And now that they've gotten past midfield, they're starting to get on a bit of a roll until that interception was thrown. Arkansas State isn't going to pull it off. And I think Oklahoma State just became one of the biggest territories in the game. They're definitely up there, but it's a bit close between a lot of different colleges. And there are now just 69 teams remaining. Miami is going to get landed on again, and this time they're going to have to play somebody tougher than USF. I think the Knights might give them a bit of a battle, and I'm sure they're going to be hungry to defend the bounce house, which is why I don't think it's any surprise that with 50 seconds left, Miami is losing, and they're going to try to make a comeback. Xavier Restrepo is breaking a tackle, but they're trailing by 11 with 45 seconds left, so they're really going to need a miracle, and even if they do score a touchdown here, getting the onside kick is not going to be easy. They've put themselves in the right position, though, and they get the two-point conversion, so we'll see what happens, but it just took too long for their offense to come alive, and the Hurricanes have been put out by UCF. That leaves us with just three colleges remaining in the state of Florida, and I can't even call it an upset because the Knights are now a Big 12 team. UTSA has been on my radar though, and we're going back to see what they can do, but I feel like they're going to struggle against the team that took out Texas. I'm not saying they can't win it, but it's going to be tough, but they actually have a lead with about two minutes left, and that five-yard loss from Baylor is huge because it was just able to knock them out of field goal range, so the Bears have been given a lifeline, but they're already committing penalties, and if they're going to avoid getting upset at home. That is not what you want to see. They're going to complete this pass for a nice 15-yard gain, though. And Blake Shapin's starting to get on a roll, as that is his third completed pass in a row. He's 20 for 31 today, so it's not like he's been terrible. And he's only thrown one interception with two touchdowns. That's another first down, though. And we're just witnessing him casually picking apart this UTSA defense until he throws it straight to Ken Robinson, who got his second interception of the day. If Baylor can hold him to the three and out, they would be able to get the ball back, but they couldn't even do that, and UTSA pulls off the upset. Frank Harris ended up dominating them, and who would have thought that at this point, they would be the biggest team in Texas. I ended up changing them to their orange color so they'd pop out a bit more, and we'll see how much longer they can keep it up for, but I'm very impressed. Utah should be interesting because Cam Rising's healthy on this roster, and they're going straight at BYU for their first game. The Holy War is a rivalry that you don't want to miss, but maybe this is one you can skip since BYU's defense decided they didn't want to show up for the game themselves. 40-17 to is a brutal way to lose to your rivals, at least they're padding their stats at the end, but we all know they just got embarrassed on their home turf, and Cole Becker was somehow player of the game. I don't know how a kicker won it over Cam Rising, who played pretty well, but at the end of the day, what's important is Utah got the result that they wanted, and there's so many big territories out west now that I can't keep up with them. Rutgers has been drawn though, and they're getting directed up to the north, which means they have to attack the Buffalo Bulls, and this is the most action we've ever seen the northeast part of the map get. With about three minutes left, it looks like the Bulls are going up by three, and Rutgers actually has a decent team this year compared to what they've had in years past but they're still in a position where they might lose this game, and on third and eight, they're not getting anywhere. To be honest, even with three timeouts left, I don't like this decision to punt the ball back to Buffalo, because even if they didn't pick up that
that fourth and 11, they could still get a stop. And now they're just going to have to hope they're able to force a three and out on this running back. So we'll see if the Scarlet Knights made the right decision. Even that option run faked me out. But for whatever reason, their quarterback hesitated and he isn't going to do it on third and nine, but he's also not going to get the first. So Rutgers has another opportunity to go down the field and get at least a field goal, but this one's intercepted and the Bulls are going to win in the end. So they're going to control the entire Northeast. And I'm so used to all these states being unclaimed. So this is a nice change of pace. Buffalo's in a really good position to cruise their way to the end of imperialism. And the only way they'll get put out is if someone like Pitt or Maryland lands in their direction. We're going back to James Madison though to see what they can do. And this is their chance to take the state from Virginia. The last time these two teams played in real life, the Dukes came out on top. And if Virginia can't score a touchdown in 22 seconds, that's going to happen again. Getting tackled in bounds there is going to hurt a ton because now there's only 11 seconds remaining and they're struggling to get in field goal range. Fourth and two, it is all on the line and they are going to just pick it up, but they need to get the spike off in time and they're not hiking the ball. That literally ran down the rest of the clock and I guess the Dukes are going to take the rest of the state. To be honest, because of how bad Virginia has been in real life this year, I can't even say that it's an upset. And James Madison is a legit team, so there's another underdog that you can root for. As for Arizona, we'll see what they do in their next game, but going on the road at Texas Tech could give them some issues, and this game's in front of a sold-out crowd. Texas Tech clearly didn't want to disappoint in front of all their home fans, winning by 30, and they had almost double the total yards of Arizona. That result gives the Red Raiders one of the biggest territories in the entire United States, and don't worry, I also remembered to fix Hawaii. That piece of land is not helping them, as it's just another point where they could get attacked, and Oklahoma State already has so much land, but they're going to go for even more, and evidently, they want all of what Texas Tech just took. I can guarantee the winner of this will have the most land in the country, and Texas Tech must have been exhausted from their previous game because they're about to go down by 16 points, and Tyler Shuck just hasn't been any good today as he is going to throw four straight incompletions. Well, it's going to take me a bit to give all of this territory to Oklahoma State, but they've now became the biggest college, touching at least 17 other colleges. We're also at the halfway point right now, so they were able to make the cut on that, and North Carolina has already had to play in multiple different games, but now they have to face off against Tennessee, and if they're going to put out Kentucky, they might as well put out the volunteers as well. On a fourth and four with a few minutes remaining, Tennessee is not going to pick up the first down. And Joe Milton put this one right where he needed to, but his receiver just couldn't catch. That means with a few first downs, North Carolina would be able to run out the rest of the clock, but they're already on a third and seven, so Drake May is going to have to drop back, take his drag, and that's going to go the distance. Tennessee is on the brink of elimination, and Omarion Hampton's going to take this one for about 10. So it all comes down to this third and two, where he is going to get it on the counter plus more. The Tar Heels have won three games now, and if Kentucky's going to be out, at least Tennessee is as well. I assume that they were going to win at home, but Joe Milton did not perform well. And with this wheel spin, we're going to be taken to San Diego State. So there's a lot of different ways this arrow could go, but it goes to the Southwest. And what did I say about Oklahoma State controlling all these islands? It's just going to lead to them getting attacked more. And they're very fortunate to still have a lead with a minute left because San Diego State just scored a touchdown and at least they recover the onside kick, which gives them a good chance of sealing it, but they can't get held to a three and out on this drive. That stumble from Ollie Gordon could come back to bite them if they don't pick this up, but they get it anyways. And Oklahoma State's going to survive with another win. But if they continue to play in a ton of different matchups, eventually something's got to give. They're a solid team, but you can only win so many matchups before somebody beats you. And we haven't seen my favorite team, Iowa, play yet, but hopefully their offense decides to show up today. Speaking of the Iowa offense, I accidentally hit more instead of less on this pick through prize picks today's video sponsor. And I'm so upset that I lost my streak fading Iowa's offense, but at least I still had some things go my way. And prize picks is available in over 30 different states. So if you're not already on there, all you have to do is pick higher or lower on player projections and code board doubles your initial deposit up to $100. It's definitely added to my college football game day experience. And if you sign up with code board, make sure you play responsibly. But let's see how Iowa does in imperialism. And the Cyclones have the home field advantage. But if they give up any more yards here, they're going to go down with a couple of minutes remaining. And Iowa is attempting a long field goal here, which is going to go down the middle. I can't even make fun of their offense because they've put up a lot more points than normal. And on third and eight, Iowa State's quarterback's going to sit back there in the pocket, take another sack, and fumble it for even more yards. That makes it a fourth and 20 for the Cyclones, and Iowa's defense is way too good to give that up. So they have taken the state for themselves. And if their offense can continue to do even a decent job, they should make a deep run. As much crap as I give them, I have to admit, they have an elite defense, and Notre Dame has already beaten Ohio State, so we'll see what's up next. But Purdue is not going to be as challenging. It's one thing to take down Western Kentucky, but it's another thing to beat the Irish. And the Boilermakers should just be proud that they were able to make it this far. Obviously, they ended up losing by a lot, and I think it's hilarious that all of these Mac schools are now boxed in by the Irish. If any of these schools want to expand their territory, they have to beat Notre Dame, and I doubt that would happen, but now we're going to go see what USC can do, and they've already
already knocked out Fresno State. This time they're going to the Northeast again, where they're going to have an opportunity to redeem themselves against Utah. This could be the game that eliminates them from imperialism, but they have a seven point lead with a minute left, and Utah still has one final chance, but they're going to have to go another 61 yards down the field and score a touchdown, which is not going to happen as the USC defense has stepped up again. They forced three interceptions on Cam Rising today, and I think every team should be terrified at how good they look, because if I had to pick a favorite right now based on level of play, it's them or Notre Dame. Oregon State's another team that hasn't had to take the field yet, but they're gunning straight for the team that put out Oregon, and Cal did them a favor, so we'll see how they repay them. The least they could do is let the Golden Bears keep it close, but they have a long way to go if they're going to tie this game up and it's intercepted. With one play from their defense, they have sealed the win, and when it comes to massive territories, the West Coast is starting to get a ton of them. There's some massive land masses on the left side of the map, and I'm very interested to see how this all plays out in the end. We're going to UCLA, so once again, there's another chance for someone to lose all their territory, and the Bruins want what Oklahoma State has. There's just no way that the Cowboys can withstand all of these attacks, and freshman Dante Moore is trying to be the one that takes them down, but he has struggled to avoid taking sacks. They have no choice but to punt it back to Oklahoma State, and with one first down, the Cowboys would be able to seal it, so I don't know why they're passing, but they've given UCLA a chance because they're going to need another first down now, and Ollie Gordon's only rushed for 41 yards, so these six are not a gimme, but their quarterback's going to get it, and with Alan Bowman sealing that win, they're starting to take over California. I'm not sure how they continue to do it, but I definitely respect their efforts. And Michigan State's actually the last team standing in Michigan, but it might not be for long as they have to play against Notre Dame. I would love to see an upset here just to make things even more interesting, and it looks like we could get our wish with a couple of minutes left. The Notre Dame offense finally had a rough day, and Michigan State's already in field goal range, so no matter what happens on this third down, they're going to go up by two possessions, and it's going to be hard for the Irish to come back from this. Sam Hartman just hasn't been able to move the ball, and on this fourth and eight, he has the drag underneath, but that's not enough for the first. So the Irish have officially been eliminated, and that result shakes up everything in this region of the map. Who would have thought between Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame, and Michigan State, the Spartans would come out on top? But they have full control of that region, and now Oregon State's playing again. They're going straight for Stanford, a weaker opponent, but the Cardinal have already surprised us once when they beat San Jose State, and I don't know how this is possible, but it looks like they're going to do it again. I can't stress enough how bad this Stanford team is in real life, but they've done what it takes to beat Oregon State, and they're about to take a ton of territory. We should also probably put some respect on Casey Filkin's name because he was a main part of getting that result as he scored five touchdowns, helping Stanford get one of the biggest land masses in the country. If your team can survive the next few matchups, they're going to make the top 50, and UTSA is one of the underdogs that we've been rooting for, but unfortunately, they're going to have to travel to play at TCU, and to win this one, they're going to have to play perfectly. They held the Horn Frogs to 13 points, but they were only able to put up three themselves, so they're going to lose, and they can blame quarterback Frank Harris for this loss. It stinks, but another Another one of our underdog teams have been eliminated, and I guess if you're a TCU fan that makes you happy, but I doubt there's many watching this video. Anyways, we haven't seen Deion Sanders and his team play for a bit, but I'd assume they'd go out and crush Air Force, and they're the final military school remaining in imperialism. They've only been able to score a touchdown, so with about a minute and a half left, we can safely assume that they're going to lose this one, except they're trying to pick up the first here, and since they have all three of their timeouts remaining, it technically wouldn't be over if they were able to find the end zone, but for some reason they just wasted one after picking that one up, and they're going to run to the house for seven, but now they have no choice but to rely on recovering the onside kick and they're not going to get it, so Deion Sanders' team escapes with a win. With that result, they've taken over the entire state of Colorado, and if they don't get drawn much, they have a chance of making a run to the end. I'm pretty sure Pitts only played against someone like Kent State, so traveling to Maryland's going to be a real challenge, and this is for a spot in the top 50, so I'm surprised to see that the Terrapins only put up three points on the Panthers. That's just an embarrassing performance from them, and up to this point, they had been doing a solid job, but they're going to fall just short of making it in the top 50. Shout out to you if your team is still alive this late into imperialism. And with Illinois up next, I think that's the first time a college is playing from their state. It's going to start out tough against Missouri, and we're about to find out if Brady Cook can cook or not. Even with Luther Burden at wide receiver, he hasn't been able to do much in this game, and if they don't pick up this 4th and 20, it is most likely all over and it's dropped. All the fighting a line I have to do is make this field goal to seal the game, and they're going to be moving on to the next round. Sometimes the home squad just doesn't perform the way that they need to, but normally it gives teams an advantage, so I'm surprised to see them lose as the hosts. Buffalo is another one of our underdog picks though, and this is pointed to the Northeast, so instead of attacking somebody, they just get to claim the state of Maine, and with their position solidified there, they could ride it out until the end. As for South Alabama, they're in the mix of a bunch of different teams, and unfortunately for them, they have to play Florida State. There's still a ton of colleges left in the Southeast, but unfortunately for the Jaguars, they're not going to be one of them, and this one was just a bloodbath. 505 total yards to 148 is insane, and I didn't think South Alabama would win that, but I thought they'd put
put up a better fight. For a Sunbelt school, they have had a good team in recent years. And James Madison, another one of the Sunbelt schools is on the board, but they're going to have to travel to play at Michigan State. And you have to wonder if they're going to be able to keep up. Wow. Well, not only have they been able to do that, but they have a 13 point lead. And if Michigan State's not able to pick up this fourth and 12, they're going to have no chance of coming back. That is an interception. And Jordan McLeod is leading this team to some crazy wins. What's so interesting about that result is now a Sunbelt team surrounds all these MAC schools. And this is one of the weirdest looking territories we've seen in imperialism. If you use the transitive property, James Madison is better than Ohio State and Michigan. And I wonder what Duke's going to do because they've had an interesting season so far. They're playing against East Carolina first, another purple school, and Riley Leonard will be healthy for this game. But as time winds down in the fourth quarter, his team is trailing by seven points. And it's crucial that they find the end zone on this drive. Jordan Waters catches this and takes it for about five, six, or seven. And on the next play, Riley Leonard runs the option, but he doesn't get anywhere. Third and four now. This is a big down and they just ran the ball. So they're going back to it on fourth down and Jaquiz Moore is going to be out there on the halfback screen, but he is not going to make it to the first down marker. And Duke could get the ball back, but they need three straight defensive stops on East Carolina. And after giving up eight on that first run, it's not looking too likely, but they made sure to send the house on the next play. So it's third and five and the Blue Devils are still going to have a chance, assuming he doesn't make it to the marker and he doesn't. Just like against Notre Dame, Riley Leonard can thank his defense, but he has to get something going on this drive. And when they're forced to pass the ball, they seem to do well. So I don't know why they kept going back to the run so much. They're picking up big yardage here. And on second and one, he has plenty of time back there in the pocket just to take his check down. But instead of calling another play, he's going to spike the ball. And that's just a waste of a down. But if you're going to pass for a lot of yards, it won't matter too much. And that was brutal that they got tackled in bounds there. It is third and four. Now he takes the sack or not. He luckily got the ball out in time. But with just 15 seconds left, he's going to have to be very careful about the clock. And on fourth and four, he takes the actual sack. So that is going to seal it. East Carolina wins. And their defense got it done in front of the home crowd. As a 74 overall team, I didn't think they had what it took to beat Duke, but the Pirates are proving that the American teams can still pull off upsets like that, and I don't think Wyoming's played in a game, but they have claimed some land, which they're about to do again, is that's what the arrow directs them to. At this point on the map, there's only a couple of states that still aren't claimed, and maybe by the end of the video, all 50 of them will actually be, but Wyoming is not getting out of a game this time. They have to play somebody, and that arrow is just gonna hit Boise State instead of Utah State. That means the beautiful blue turf is under attack and the Broncos just haven't played well as they're going to get this fourth and six, but they're still down 12. So they're in a bit of a hurry up mode to try score a touchdown, but I think it's a bit too late and that interception is going to do it. Wyoming has come out and beat the Broncos on their own field and Harrison Whaley had 34 touches. If he can continue to handle that big of a load, Wyoming might be able to make some noise. And it's kind of crazy that besides Oklahoma State, they have the second largest territory. They really haven't done that much, but they do have a good roster on their side and poor North Carolina can't get out of playing in games as this time they have to face East Carolina. They were able to shock Duke so we can no longer doubt them, but evidently after seeing that, they were prepared for this game because Drake May went out and threw for seven touchdowns and East Carolina's run has ended in just two matchups. They still spice things up for us though, so I appreciate them. And poor Wyoming has been drawn to play again, but this time they have to travel to Colorado and it's gonna be hard to catch Deion Sanders off guard. Well, I'm gonna have to immediately take that back because Shadur Sanders has not had a good game and he only has one touchdown pass to Travis Hunter, so they are losing by a ton. If they can't get this two-point conversion, the game will officially be over, but they're going to get it. So now we're going to go over to the onside kick where Wyoming recovers, and I cannot believe that they were able to pull this one off. But like I said, if Harrison Whaley can continue to take large loads, they're going to win some games. And I feel like everybody's just paving the map out west for USC to dominate. The only college on paper that matches up well with them is going to be Washington. So somebody's going to have to bring their A game if they're not going to run through all of those teams. And Nebraska has yet to take the field, but they are gunning for all of Iowa. And this is the battle of terrible offenses, but good defenses. That's why it's not surprising with about three minutes left in the game. Neither team has more than 10 points, but Iowa is shooting for it. And if the Hawkeyes get in here, Nebraska is going to be in a ton of trouble. However, they managed to lose four yards when all they had to do was QB sneak it. And this collapse would be so fitting if they don't get this third and goal and they don't. Only Iowa could lose four yards on the one yard line and kick a field goal. And now Nebraska has one more shot at breaking down this Hawkeyes defense, but that won't be easy. They're one for nine on third down conversion, so I didn't have confidence in them here, but they were able to pick it up to keep the chains moving, and this offensive line must hate Jeff Sims. I don't like the decision to spike the ball either because now it's third and 18, and you can't make this up. It's now fourth and 26 in the worst offensive game of all time. They go nowhere, and the Iowa Hawkeyes hold on with their amazing defense. These quarterback stat lines are extremely hard to look at, but at the end of the day, all that matters to Hawkeyes fans is that they continue to win, and now we're headed back to the wheel where this one's gonna spin and land on Utah State. They've 
they've yet to play a game and they're surrounded by a lot of good teams, but there's a chance they could take all of Wyoming's territory, and that would be brutal since this is a rivalry game. Well, the Aggies do have a shot, but they're down by seven with a minute left, and they're now stuck on a third and 17 where they're going to run a terrible play. Their quarterback's going to break a sack before fumbling it away, and since it's been picked up, that's going to be taken to the crib, which led to Wyoming getting the win in the end. It seems like sooner rather than later, they're going to get stuck playing against USC, but for now, we're going to see what Middle Tennessee State can do for the first time, and they're going to try to take the Tar Heels land, but North Carolina's already beaten so many other opponents, so they've been warmed up and ready, but Middle Tennessee State's done a good job of keeping it close, and if they can get this two-point conversion, it's not going to be over, but that hurts their odds a lot since they're still down by two possessions, and they just weren't able to take down Drake May in the end, which means the Tar Heels are going to get a little bit more land, and in case you were wondering, all of these colleges have made the top 40. Of those teams, 26 of them are from Power 5 conferences, and Florida State is up again. This time, they're headed north, which is just going to pin them up against Auburn. The Tigers haven't had to play a single game yet, but they've managed to keep it very close with the Seminoles. They have the ball with a minute remaining, and Peyton Thorne almost threw an interception on that play, but luckily for Auburn fans, Florida State's player couldn't get a foot in bounds, and their defense is just going to have to clutch up for them instead. It's now fourth and eight, so it all comes down to this. They have a guy in motion, and Peyton Thorne's going to take the snap. He has a lot of blockers out there, but they're not going to get it, and that means the Seminoles have won yet another game. They're starting to run through all of these SEC schools, but they still have ones like Alabama and Florida surrounding them, so we'll see how they do in the future. LSU is another example, but they're a bit farther away, and of all the teams they could have played, they're going for Texas A&M. This is the Aggies' chance to get a statement win, and with a few minutes remaining, they are only down by five. Connor Wagman's going to roll out, and instead of scrambling for the first down, he threw it off his back foot for that. I don't understand that decision from him. Now they have to get it on fourth and four, and they do, but Texas A&M still has to finish off this drive against LSU, and it's practically second and goal from about the 14, so they have a lot of yardage to get, but that run has gotten them a lot closer, and this one will get them to the two, so it is a fourth and manageable where they go with the wide receiver screen and get in. If they want to protect themselves from losing on a field goal, though, they need to get this two-point conversion, and I don't know what that was. Just terrible execution on their end, so Jane Daniels now has a minute and a half to tear apart this defense, and he's already gotten onto the other side of the field, and this time he's thrown up another prayer, which goes to the 20. He is ripping apart Texas A&M right now, as Aaron Anderson's going to go for another 15 yards, and if they aren't careful with their clock management, they're going to score way too quick. However, they were smart to chew the clock and then run it in. And with only 18 seconds left, Texas A&M isn't going to have much of a chance on the two-point conversion. They actually intercept it. And if they're able to take this all the way back to the house, they would get it back within three. I don't know how fast this cornerback is, but it seems like he might have the speed. He is getting chased down and he is going to not make it. Whenever these two teams play, it is always a great game. And with 14 seconds left, we'll see if Texas A&M has any magic left in them. But the most they can realistically do is just set themselves up to go for the Hail Mary. And they did a perfect job of that as they are past midfield. Connor Wiegman breaks the sack. He gets the throw off and this is going to result in a drop. They could have won the game on that play. And I really thought they were about to pull it off, but it just didn't end up happening in the end. LSU has now won another matchup and the purple teams are really starting to take over. But what would really accelerate that is if someone like Washington beat Stanford. I don't think the Cardinal have it in them to actually go out and continue to win. But for now, we're sticking with LSU attacking to the Northeast and they're going straight for Southern Miss. If Frank Gore Jr. was ever going to shine, now would be the time to make his mark on imperialism, but Southern Miss just wasn't able to keep up with LSU as they've only put up seven points, and with four turnovers, that's what you'd expect. Just more and more land for the Tigers now, but if they want to win at all, they should probably stop expanding so quickly. They can't avoid being landed on though as they have to play again, and this time it's them versus Tulane. The Green Wave have a chance to do something really funny here, and they're only trailing by five with two minutes left, so they have a chance to actually win this game. All they have to do is score a touchdown on this drive to take the lead, but Michael Pratt did not have good pocket awareness there. This time, he's just going to go to the flat for a few extra, and that makes it third and seven already, where they're going to run the shakes concept and get the first. Now that they're past midfield, the pressure has got to be on the Tigers a little bit, but so far, Michael Pratt has not impressed me with his scrambling ability, but he has with his arm. There's still plenty of time left, so it's all going to come down to if LSU's defense can get a stop or not, and they've just picked up another set of downs, so all of the momentum is swinging in their favor, but now they're going to spike the ball, and I hate that decision because now it's third and ten, and their quarterback missed the throw. His wide receiver could not have been more open, and now all the pressure is on Michael Pratt to convert on fourth down. He is going to throw it deep, and this is going to be caught or knocked down. That was an amazing defensive play there, and LSU deserves to leave with a win. This is obviously the play of the game, and Tulane came so close there, but since they fell just short, LSU is going to continue their expansion, and they've been landed on like three times in a row, so 
this is going to be a nice change of pace. Washington, who's yet to play a game, is going down south, and I swear I just predicted this matchup a few rounds ago. This will be the toughest opponent Stanford's faced yet, and they did their best, but in the end, they just didn't have what it took to stop Michael Penix consistently, so after all of their efforts, they've been put out of imperialism, and the West Coast continues to get thinner and thinner with colleges. UCF now has to play, and I think there's only one direction they can go, because the Gators block them from reaching anybody else, and winning at the Swamp is going to be difficult. They're in a tie game with about 90 seconds left, but the Gators could run down the clock, and I'm surprised that down here on the goal line, they're not going to do that before scoring a touchdown. They've left a lot of time for the Knights to respond, but they could also just trust their defense, and the ball is loose on the ground. They're going to recover, so the Gators have sealed their win, unless they miss this 49-yard field goal, but it's down the middle. John Rise Plumley just couldn't take down Florida, and Montreal Johnson Jr. also had a pretty solid performance. With that result, there's only two teams remaining in the state, and I can't wait to see what happens when they have to battle it out, but for now, we're going to go to Northwestern, and I don't think they've stepped onto the field once yet. It's a close call, but they're going to be going to Northern Illinois, and it's embarrassing the Wildcats are the lower overall team. They're going into this one as the underdogs, but they've won this one with ease as it is 24-0, and this result would not make my old editor, who was an NIU fan, happy, but unfortunately, he no longer edits for me, and I am looking for another editor if you know one. Just reach out to me on Twitter, and we're going back to the wheel where Alabama has to play for the first time. Depending on where the arrow lands, things could get very interesting, but instead, they're traveling to Memphis, and this is a team that beat Ole Miss early on, but they just weren't able to score many points on the Crimson Tide defense, and they just forced another stop. I mean, they've been incredible today. I guess it's no surprise that Alabama got that win, and since some other colleges have already been eliminated, they're real contenders to win it all. I'm almost positive that NC State has beaten somebody, but now they're going to have to do it again against South Carolina, and they're also going to have to do it on the road. They might be trailing by six, but they do have a chance with their left-handed quarterback, and I think that this is the first lefty that we've seen in this imperialism. Third and seven already, though, Brennan Armstrong is going to have to throw something up, and he throws it deep, which is going to be knocked away, and I'm surprised that he didn't look for something underneath. I guess he wanted the big shot. He's going to drop that ball, and South Carolina is going to leave with a win because of it. It wasn't Spencer Rattler that got them this result, but I doubt he cares because his team's been able to stay alive, and I just realized that Clemson has somehow avoided playing in a single game. I don't understand how that's possible. Wisconsin's going to be attacking to the southwest, and it's going to be them versus Iowa for a ton of land. This is another one that will probably be a defensive masterclass, and you can't make this up. Here in the fourth quarter, Iowa has still not scored a single point, so just like in real life, their offense is painfully hard to watch, and if they can't recover this onside kick, they're going to be eliminated, and that will seal it. Wisconsin's about to get a ton of territory, and they're not going to have as much as Wyoming, but they are getting up there. I'd argue that they also have less than Washington and Oklahoma State, but they're in a good spot to have that much land because they're not touching many teams, and we finally landed on the three max schools that have been surrounded. All three of them are engulfed by James Madison's purple, but Ball State has an opportunity to escape it, and with two minutes remaining, they're only trailing by one to the Dukes, so if they can get in field goal range, they'd be able to win. Lane Hatcher's only thrown for 78 yards up to this point, though, and both offenses have clearly struggled today if neither team has more than 10 points here in the fourth quarter. Ball State is starting to build up some momentum, though, as they're getting to about the 40, and James Madison needs to generate some pressure because they're just giving the quarterback way too much time. He's been able to pick apart their defense, but he finally misses a pass, and I'm not sure if Ball State's in field goal range or not, but that sack could hurt. It is third and 12, and they've taken the clock all the way down to seven seconds, so no matter what happens here, they want to go for the field goal, but it's intercepted, and that was the one thing that they couldn't do. James Madison has won another game, and I cannot believe Lane Hatcher threw a pick in that position. Now there's only two teams that are surrounded by the Dukes, and somehow SMU has also avoided playing until now, but their first matchup's against North Texas, and it's time for them to prove why they deserve to join the ACC. It's sure not based on location, so it needs to be based on skill since they're going to do it, and I think they're going to beat North Texas, but they do have 39 seconds to get at least a field goal, so the Mean Green have a chance if they're able to pull it off on third and six, they're just going to get tackled in bounds though, and with no timeouts left, that's going to hurt them a ton. It happened on back-to-back -back plays. They do pick up the first, but now they're in a position where they can't really get in field goal range, and they got to go for the Hail Mary, but there's no way their quarterback can throw it that far. This was a very inaccurate throw that's knocked away, but caught, and there's no time remaining on the clock, but can you imagine if there was and that got them in field goal range? That was so close to being one of the coolest endings we've ever witnessed, but instead, SMU gets the victory. Well, with a few more results, we'll know who made the top 25, and Mississippi State has avoided playing up until this point, but now they have to go to Alabama, and this will probably be an uphill battle for them. I'm kind of surprised that with two minutes left, it is a tie game at 28, but Mississippi State has the ball, and they could go 
down on this drive and score, but Will Rogers is going to take the sack, and I don't know why they're in such a rush to get another snap off. If they just wind down the clock, Alabama wouldn't have time to score, but now they have to punt it back with a minute remaining, and the Crimson Tide are going to have plenty of time to at least get in field goal range since they're already at about midfield. The Bulldogs must really trust their defense or not think Jalen Milrow can pull it off, but he just delivered a dart to Malik Benson, and they're moving the ball. However, for some reason, he's not hiking it, and I guess it's because they already feel like they're in field goal range, but that is very risky. He needs to go down with time remaining, and it seems like Alabama is just going to avoid getting beat. Will Reichard came up very clutch at the end, and now the Crimson Tide have a couple of wins under their belt. Back to the wheel now, though, and we are going to get Clemson for the first time. So this Southeast region is starting to heat up, and it's the Tigers versus Florida State. This is such a big matchup for both of these teams, and Clemson getting their score doubled by the Seminoles is not something I was expecting, but they've just played better. They are going to force a late fumble, but it's a bit too late to come back. And Jordan Travis and Trey Benson both put out the Tigers. That duo has been playing very well in imperialism. And even though they expanded a bit early, it seems like they're going to make it to the end. TCU is up again though, and they're going to be headed to the Northwest, which puts them up against none other than SMU. And I think this one's called the Battle for the Iron Skillet. So an interesting rivalry name that ultimately just wasn't that close as it's a 30 point blowout. Preston Stone threw for four interceptions while Chandler Morse threw for four touchdowns. So it's no surprise that TCU was able to win by that much. And if your team's still in this, they've made it into the top 25. Of all of those colleges, eight of them still haven't played in a game. And sometimes it's just the luck of the draw as TCU's playing again. And this time they're forced to attack Oklahoma. So it's gonna be a bit harder for them to stay alive. With about two minutes left, they're on a huge fourth and four that they are going to convert to stay in it. So TCU might be trailing by eight, but with a touchdown and a two point conversion, they're able to tie it. And for a big 12 matchup, I can't believe how low scoring it is. What the Horn Frogs don't want to do is give Dylan Gabriel too much time to cook, but I guess they don't care because they scored immediately and on the two-point conversion, Chandler Morris isn't going to get it. He got leveled before he could even think about reaching the end zone, but the onside kick is recovered by TCU, and this is exactly why we spectate all of these at the end of the game. All the Horn Frogs need is a field goal, and they'd be able to upset Oklahoma, but they throw an interception immediately, and what was Chandler Morris thinking there? They have all three of their timeouts, so they are able to get the ball back if they force a three and out, but they just had the opportunity of a lifetime and they blew it. And I can't believe it. On a third and two, Javante Barnes is going to pick it up. So Oklahoma will survive. And with how that game ended, TCU fans are going to be devastated. To be honest, their loss to Georgia in the championship was better because at least they knew they had no hope. And now let's focus on USC where this arrow is going to take us to the north. And that means we get the Trojans versus Washington. This will most likely ultimately decide who comes out of the west. And with about a minute remaining, USC is winning, but Washington has the ball down by five. And the game will be in the hand of Michael Penix Jr., who has already picked up two first downs. All Caleb Williams can do is watch from the sidelines as his fate is determined by his defense, but they just got a huge sack, and that means it is third and 18 for the Huskies, where they're only going to get a couple of yards, so they're going to need to throw for at least 14 on fourth down, and they're not going to get it. Surprisingly, the Trojans' defense actually held on, and that's going to leave us with way too much yellow out here in the West. There's really only a few teams remaining on this side of the map, and I can't believe that Wyoming is still in it, but they've had a great run and Louisiana Tech has not, but they just hadn't been landed on. So now they have to prove themselves against Oklahoma State and the Cowboys have avoided playing for quite a bit. So they must be a little rusty or something if they're only beating Louisiana Tech by four points. They could actually be put out if their defense isn't able to clutch up and they're giving up a massive play to the wide receiver. He's gonna break free and take it to the crib. So Louisiana Tech just went up on the Cowboys and Alan Bowman's gonna have to clutch up. If they can at least get it to overtime by getting in field goal range, I think they'd be okay. He's thrown it deep though and it was was almost picked. So that was a chance for them to be eliminated and for it to all be over. He's thrown it to the same player though, and this time they do catch it. But I have noticed that Oklahoma State still has three timeouts remaining. So if they force a three and out, they'll be able to get the ball back. And it looks like that's what's going to happen is Louisiana Tech just goes with another run, giving the Cowboys a chance that they really don't deserve. They shouldn't even be in a close game with Louisiana Tech right now, but they are. And there's so much of the map on the line with 37 seconds remaining. Alan Bowman finds his receiver, and I hope we're not witnessing the the collapse of Louisiana Tech, but they're giving him way too much time. So I think the Cowboys are already in field goal range, but they go with a run instead of a pass and it worked out. It's taking them forever to spike the ball though. I don't know what he is doing and I'd assume that they probably have one more play in them before they go for the field goal. This one is going to go out of bounds. And after they took their three, we have made it to overtime where Oklahoma State's already on a second and 12. Alan Bowman's rolling out, thrown off of his back foot. And I don't know what he's doing, but they have to pick up this third and long. They're going to float it. And that was almost picked. Louisiana Tech might have choked, but they can win with
with a touchdown. And on the first play of their drive, Oklahoma State sent a blitz, but they were prepared for it, so they're going to get the first down. They are just 14 yards away from sending this imperialism into total chaos. And Oklahoma State's had such a good run, so it'd be a shame if it ended now. And they have an opportunity to force a field goal here, but they didn't guard the dragon. He's going to fight for extra yardage. Louisiana Tech is so close to winning it, though they're not running on the goal line. They're passing instead, and that was risky, but they have held on to the touchdown, and the Cowboys have been upset on their home field. I did not see this result coming at all, but that has really shaken up the map, and there's now a sea of blue in the southwest region. Those are the games that we watch imperialism for. That was awesome. And LSU's back on the wheel, this time going to the southwest, which means it's them versus Oklahoma, and the winner of this could very well win the entire thing. The Sooners might have had the home field advantage, but they're down by seven to the Tigers, and that's a bad sack from Dylan Gabriel. They're already on a third and 16, and I wish he wouldn't have spiked the ball there, but they're going to get a few yards, except their receiver didn't even try to get his feet in bounds here. So with no effort to drag the toe, it is a very long fourth down that they have to convert. Dylan Gabriel throws it deep, and it is intercepted. LSU has won yet another game, and apparently Zai Alexander had two picks himself. Jaden Daniels continues to get this team farther and farther, and almost all of Texas is going to belong to LSU now, but the portion that doesn't goes to Louisiana Tech. I still cannot believe that they were able to knock out Oklahoma State, and Bowling Green is another one of those Mac schools that's trapped, but they're going to have a chance to break out versus James Madison. The last time the Dukes played, they only scored seven points, and Bowling Green had their way with them today, beating them by 17, so unfortunately, their run is going to end, and now Miami, Ohio is surrounded by just the Falcons. The Mac schools have taken over most of the Northeastern region, and those are normally not the teams we get there, so that's super exciting, but I'm sure Florida State's not excited that they have to play again, especially since it'll be at the Swamp. I'm pretty sure the Gators won the Power 5 only imperialism, so I thought they'd be a threat, but the Seminoles have annihilated and embarrassed them. No team's been able to stop Jordan Travis and Trey Benson, and those two accounted for the six touchdowns that put the Gators out. As a Kentucky fan, I obviously am going to enjoy seeing stuff like that, and I'd also like to see North Carolina get beat since they took my Wildcats out. They're going up against Bowling Green, though, so they're probably going to go out and destroy them, and I don't understand how this is a contest with a little bit under two minutes remaining. I'm excited for it, but Bowling Green is 11 overalls worse than the Tar Heels, and that is another dot, so they legitimately have a chance to drive down the field and take a lead on North Carolina, but they're going to have to finish the drive off, and they've gone with back-to-back -back runs, so I'd like to see them pass again because that's what was working for them, and that's how they're going to get this first. 49 seconds left now inside the Tar Heels red zone. All they need is about another 15 yards. The throw is going to get them to the two, but unfortunately, the ball was dropped, and if he could have just caught it, they would have been set up for success, but what was that play? A very interesting two-step drop back, and then he threw it off of his back foot. Now he's going to throw it to the end zone, and Connor Baselick should have just scrambled for the first down, but he's going to pitch it to Terry on Stewart, and they're going up. All Bowling Green has to do is make this extra point to take the lead, and North Carolina only has 22 seconds left. If Drake May can't get his team in field goal range, they're going to get upset, and this is a terrible first play, but I guess this Bowling Green defense is legit. I mean, they held James Madison to just 10 points, and assuming they don't give up a massive play in the next 12 seconds, they're going to take down North Carolina. The ball is intercepted. Drake May's been picked off, and he has been eliminated. First Louisiana Tech, now Bowling Green pulling off huge upsets, and it might not make make any logical sense, but this has been very entertaining. Theoretically, with all the chaos going on, any of the remaining teams could win it all, and that even goes for Illinois, who's normally not very good at football. It was close, but the arrow has directed them towards Wisconsin, and the Badgers have already taken down multiple Big Ten West teams, so it makes sense that they would also destroy the fighting Illini at home. Tanner Mordecai had almost a perfect game, and the Badgers have earned themselves even more land. Between them, Wyoming, and USC, I don't know who has the most territory, but I can promise that sometime in the near future, one of them's going to lose it all, and it could be Wisconsin in this game where they're going to attack to the southeast, pinning them up against none other than Northwestern. At this point, they might as well just run through the entire Big Ten, and if you don't count USC, who's joining next year, they're the last one standing. I'm pretty sure that they knocked out like half of the teams themselves, but if you want to steal this much territory, that's what it takes. And we're starting to fly through some of these teams with Washington State playing for the first time now. They're surrounded by USC and Wyoming, so I think we know who they want to land on, but unfortunately for them, they didn't get their way, and if they're going to pull this off, Cam Ward's gonna have to go nuts. I mean, he did his best, but Caleb Williams has just been going off. He threw that guy off of him to get into the end zone and go up 28, and that was his fifth touchdown of the day, with only two of them coming through the air. Just to make things look a little better, I've made USC the color of red, and if they can beat Wyoming and Louisiana Tech, they'll take over the entire western region. One of those smaller schools is gonna need to pull off a crazy upset or something, and Miami, Ohio is the last team that's been trapped in the middle. So no matter where that arrow went, they were playing Bowling Green. With one win, they could ruin all of the Falcons
Falcons progress. And with a minute remaining, it is all tied up. Brett Gabbard's going to just throw it to his check down. It's going to be fourth down. And we're about to see if Miami, Ohio's kicker has the leg, which he does. Bowling Green is in a ton of trouble. They were able to take down North Carolina, but not the Red Hawks. And on third and 18, Connor Baselick is going to drop back. He needs to just throw up a prayer. But since he hasn't been able to get the ball out in time, he's just going to quickly throw it on this one. And when it's fourth and 24, you cannot make that read. With this terrible stat line, Brett Gabbert took down the Falcons. And I don't know how you lose to a guy that only completed 36% of his passes, but I guess as long as you get the win, that's all that really matters. And Kansas has avoided taking the field for so long, but now they have to travel to play Wisconsin. And Jalen Daniels is healthy, so they can't use that excuse. He's done well as with two minutes remaining, it is all tied up at 31. That is going to go for at least eight or nine yards. But if they don't pick up this third down, they're going to have to punt it back to the Badgers. And that was close. Apparently he did get the first down though. And another rollout pass is going to go for at least 20 yards. So Kansas is approaching field goal range and that would allow them to put out the Badgers. Considering they took it down to about 20 seconds left, I'd think they're in field goal range. And with that throw, they definitely are, but they're going for even more and there's a touchdown. Kansas has gone up by seven points and they've given Wisconsin a slight chance at coming back just off a of Hail Mary. But when you have somebody that wide open in the end zone, you have to take it. And what are they doing on defense? Tanner Mordecai can definitely reach the end zone from this distance now. He throws it up and it is going to be knocked away. But Wisconsin shouldn't have even had a chance there. And Devin Neal had a fantastic performance. He is the reason that the Jayhawks have taken down the Badgers. And look at all of the blue we now have in the middle of the U.S. I'm not sure if it's going to last, but those teams have performed very well. And there's only two teams South Carolina can attack from their position. But they've gotten very lucky it's Miami, Ohio, and not Florida State. They can just sweep in and take all the land that the Red Hawks have. And I thought maybe Brett Gabbert would put up a better fight, but his team has only scored 14 points, so it's all going to be over. Dakari and Joyner rushed for 176 yards on the MAC defense, and now all of that territory belongs to the Gamecocks. It's hard to believe that there's still multiple teams on this wheel that have yet to play a game, and speaking of them, Georgia Tech is one of those that has to play now, and even better, they're facing off against UAB, so one of these two teams is going to have to earn their place, and what an embarrassing performance from Georgia Tech's offense, putting up only three points. Jermaine Brown Jr. is the reason that the Blazers were able to win, but also their defense, who was completely on top of it. We're closing in on a top 10, but one more team has to lose first. And apparently UAB wants to play another game, this time going up north, which will put them up against South Carolina. They won't have the home field advantage in this one though. And I have to give credit to South Carolina for playing as well as they have this far into imperialism. It feels like they've won every game by a lot. And Spencer Rattler showed up today scoring four touchdowns, which is why South Carolina has been able to continue to expand. And that solidifies their spot in the top 10 with all of these other colleges. Of these 10, only three of them are from smaller conferences, and Florida State's been dominating from the very beginning, so I'm very surprised they're still in it and will be playing LSU. Both of these teams have done a fantastic job of winning matchup after matchup, and I can guarantee that we're going to have a very tight finish, because with a minute and a half left, LSU has a six-point lead, but the Seminoles have the ball. Jordan Travis just broke a sack there to complete this pass, and what a catch from Keon Coleman. Obviously, in real life, the Seminoles were able to win this one, but right now they're losing to the Tigers, and on second and five, they go with the halfback draw instead, which I don't like, because you just got to let Jordan Travis sling it. He is your best player. And they just picked up a first down. So they are moving the chains. That is going to be another dump off. And Trey Benson's been ruled out for the game with bruised ribs. So that might explain why Florida State is losing to LSU right now, but they could still score a touchdown and win it all. They're inside the red zone, but they need to go ahead and snap the ball. 22 seconds left now. Jordan Travis takes the drag underneath and they have one timeout, but they don't want to use it. So they're going to spike the ball instead, which leaves us with just 10 seconds remaining. I saw somebody open in the end zone, but Jordan Travis didn't see Keon Coleman dust this corner, so he has to somehow reach the end zone on this one play. It's thrown underneath, and they're not going to do it. LSU's defense came up clutch there in the end, and that offensive shootout was super fun to watch. Unfortunately for Florida State fans, though, they have now been eliminated, and most of the southeastern region now belongs to the Tigers. Just nine colleges remaining now. Next up is going to be Pitt playing, and it's been a minute since they've taken the field. They're going in the direction of South Carolina, so this should be a great matchup. On paper, these teams are pretty even, and with 37 seconds left, Pitt is down by four, but they have the ball. And if they can go down the field on this Gamecocks defense and score a touchdown, they're going to win. But they have half a minute to get 65 yards. So that is not going to be easy for them to do, though. They are past midfield. And it's obvious that defense has been non-existent in this matchup. It's very high scoring. But when there's this little time left, you can't afford to throw it to your checkdowns because you're still so far away from the end zone. And because it took them so long to snap it, this is probably the final play of the game, which is knocked away. And the Gamecocks have survived once again, which is just remarkable that they're still alive. Live. They're legit playing like how South Carolina fans wish they would in real life, and more of the big conference schools can.
continue to lose. So that just keeps giving our underdog teams a chance. But unfortunately for Buffalo, they're going to have to play in this next game. And they are so lucky that there's an unclaimed state they can take over. You don't make it this far purely based on skill. There is some luck involved. And it feels like LSU has already played like 50 times already. And if you go in the east direction, you're going to run into South Carolina. So the Gamecocks have not been able to avoid playing. And we knew that they'd eventually lose, but I didn't see them only putting up 10 points. They've been able to dominate so many games with their offense, but this LSU defense is crazy, and that interception is a fitting ending. Spencer Rattler threw three of them, so that's the reason they lost. And after all of those wins, South Carolina's effort was for nothing. I mean, they put on a good show for us, but they came up short in the end. And now there's just seven teams remaining with USC up next. No matter what happens here, they're going to be attacking a smaller school. And because of Hawaii, Louisiana Tech is not off the hook. They have one overtime win over Oklahoma State, but that's it. And Caleb Williams had so much fun picking them apart, they had to put in the backup to finish the rest of the game. I would have loved to see an upset there, but that was so unlikely. And with just six colleges remaining, it looks like Kansas is up next. So we'll see what direction they're going to be going. It's headed down to the Southwest, and that means it's them versus USC. If they could pull this off, I would no longer consider them a basketball school, but they clearly are not ready for that level of competition yet, and it is all over. Are they going to score on the final play? No. Honestly, it was just an embarrassing game, and Jalen Daniels only completed 33% of his passes, while Caleb Williams threw for six touchdowns. Nobody's been able to stop the former Heisman winner in these recent matchups, and with just a few teams remaining, up next is going to be Buffalo. So I think we all know what their fate most likely is, and we'll see what they can do against LSU. It's at Death Valley, which makes it even worse. But here in the fourth quarter, they've put up a good fight besides that terrible fourth down play call. And after that, LSU would drive down and kick a field goal. So there's pretty much no hope left for them. And Jaden Daniels has gotten his team into the final four. There's one program up here though that is not like the others. And can you imagine the scenes if Wyoming was able to win the entire thing? That would be insane. But now LSU is gonna have to travel to the Southwest. And the only team really in that vicinity is USC. So we're about to get an incredible matchup. And with about two minutes left, USC has to pick up this third nine if they don't want to punt it back. But because Caleb Williams just took a check down, the Tigers have the ball and they're only trailing by three so they could win with a touchdown. But Jaden Daniels still has to get his team down the length of the field and that one over the middle gets him to about the 40. Malik Neighbors has had a big day going for 94 yards on seven catches and getting a touchdown. So I'd assume the Trojan defense would focus on stopping him now and instead that means Aaron Anderson's gonna have some open space. LSU has a ton of targets that they can go to and Jaden Daniels has done a good job but they have to finish off this drive on second and goal. He is gonna throw it and it is gonna be knocked away. With an interception here, Caden Bullock could have ended it all but the stud at safety wasn't able to hold on. Now it's third and goal and LSU is going to be marked a bit short so it's gonna be a tie game and why are they kicking it now? They could have taken the clock down to zero but instead they've given Caleb Williams 23 seconds and that's plenty of time for someone of his caliber to get his team in field goal range. That throw is gonna get into about the 45 and I just don't understand that move from LSU but they're gonna tackle them in bounds here and instead of using their timeout, USC just goes with one more play. Caleb Williams takes off and there's no way he makes it to the end zone. We are headed to overtime and LSU is getting the ball first. Noah Kane takes the handoff and it looks like he just doesn't want to go down. He is breaking tackle after tackle. And if the Tigers are going to win this game, that is the level of effort that's needed. It's a new set of downs and Jane Daniels just keeps giving it to Noah Kane for good reason. But eventually the Trojans are going to focus in on stopping the run. And what are you doing, Jaden Daniels? He's very fortunate that they recovered the football, but they're going to have to kick a field goal. And why didn't they even pass it there? I guess they're going to trust their defense to stop the reigning Heisman winner. And he just took down Arizona in overtime in real life. So that is not a smart decision. Second and two now after picking up eight on that first down play, he's going to try to take off. He breaks one tackle and maybe LSU did make the right choice. It's now third and six. He takes another sack and that means we are headed to another overtime period. This could go back and forth for a long time. LSU is known for keeping it close with teams in overtime and on third and five, Caleb Williams is going to pump fake it. Now he needs to find his receiver who is going to make it past the first down marker. I wasn't sure if Mario Williams had what it took, but the running game for USC is going nowhere. So they should probably pass it instead of continuing to hand it off. And I don't understand why you'd take the ball out of your Heisman winning quarterback. On third down, he just threw to the flat. So once again, LSU holds them to three. And now the Tigers can win it with a touchdown. On first and 10, Jaden Daniel steps back in the pocket. He throws it and that is a wide open Brian Thomas Jr. So the USC defense has finally collapsed in the end and Jaden Daniels deserves player of the game. All that's left is two SEC schools and a Mountain West one. So we will see if Wyoming can keep up with these other programs. And if this wheel spin doesn't point towards them, they're automatically making the championship, but I have to admit, they're more in this direction than Alabama is, so LSU is going to attack them, and it looks like going into halftime, they're only going to be down 14-7, to which isn't terrible. They've done
done a decent job of keeping up with the Tigers better than I thought they would, and maybe they can pull off the miracle upset. It's third and 10 in the third quarter for LSU, and they just go with the halfback draw that they're not going to get. So Wyoming got the ball back, and guess who's been moving it down the field? LSU's defense has gotten them to a third and four, and their quarterback is going to shed the sack, and maybe he can complete a pass as well. That is a first down. Andrew Peasley and Wyoming actually stand a chance right now, but Harrison Whaley is averaging 1.2 yards per carry, and they normally lean on him, but since they can't run the ball, they have to pass, and that's not in. If they're going to pull off the upset, they have to be more aggressive than that. But after forcing a fumble on LSU, they are back inside the red zone, and now it's second and 13, where they're going to go with another run to Harrison Whaley, but he's just not had a very good day, and on third and eight, surely they're going to go with the pass, but they don't. They did the draw, and now they want to be aggressive on fourth and six. I don't see anything open, though, and that was a laser. This window was not here, but Andrew Peasley just decided to force it in there anyway, and there's a lot of pressure on Jaden Daniels right now, because they should not be in this close of a battle with Wyoming, who gets the sack. That is going to take the Tigers out of field goal range, and they are punting it back to Wyoming right now. So if the Cowboys can just get a few first downs, they could legitimately win, and they are already chewing the clock, so the computer's doing the right thing in this situation, but they just can't run the ball on LSU, so they're passing it, and that's gonna almost be picked. In all honesty, it was the right read, but it was just a bit too late, and the Cowboys are just gonna have to trust their defense on the Tigers to get a stop, and that's gonna be very hard to do. Malik Neighbors has already broken free for 20, at least 25, maybe 30 now, and it feels like all the momentum just swung in LSU's direction, which is very unfortunate. We've made it all the way to the end, rooting on Wyoming to pull it off, but now the Tigers are guaranteed at least a field goal. Jaden Daniels is gonna try to escape the pocket, but they were a ball hawk on him right there. They didn't wanna let him get free, and that is gonna be intercepted by Wyoming. Jaden Daniels didn't see anything open, so he tried to force it in such a tight window, and it's not completely over yet, but it almost is. They just need one more first, because there's still a minute left, and LSU had two timeouts, so it all comes down to this. Third and two, Andrew Peasley keeps it, and they are going on to the championship. I cannot believe that Wyoming has made it this far, but Andrew Peasley wanted that win in the second half, and Wyoming couldn't have played better with no turnovers on their end. I don't exactly know how they're going to do it, but they're going to have to compete with Alabama, and this spin for home field advantage is a very big deal, which lands on Wyoming. I cannot believe it's come down to these two teams, but here's your college football imperialism national championship. Alabama got the ball first, so we'll see if they can make a statement. They're not going to pick up the first down, and that's an early defensive stop for Wyoming. The issue is the Cowboys are a little bit pinned back down on the goal line, so I doubt they're going to do much, and it's probably smart to avoid taking a safety here, but now Alabama has it in good field positioning, and on third and nine, Jalen Milrow is throwing it deep, but it's going to be knocked down. Wyoming's defense is like a 77 overall on paper, but they play so well, and I cannot believe this ball doinked off of the upright and ended up going in. If Wyoming's going to have a chance, Alabama can't have luck on their side, but their first two offensive drives have looked rough so far, and on this third and seven, I just don't see Andrew Peasley throwing it until now. That's good. However, it's immediately coming back with a flag, and on third and 17, they are going to need a lot of yardage here, but they're not going to get it. This game does not seem to be going the way that it needs to if Wyoming's going to stay in it like they did against LSU, and of course, Alabama is the team that made it to the championship after all of that. I'm rooting for them to move the ball, and hopefully putting that first quarter in the past, but it's now second and eight, and they just continue to try to run it, and it's not working. I figured they would have learned that lesson against LSU, but it just hasn't been that way. There's another drop, and that led to another Alabama touchdown, so they really need to get something going on this drive, but none of their wide receivers can hold on to the football. If you watched my quarterback Road to Glory, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about, but with 54 seconds left in the first half, it looks like they finally got something going. They're getting down to about the red zone, and this is Wyoming's chance to finally put some points on the board. On third and nine, they're not going to get much though, and they're even taking false starts, so I don't think they have what it takes to pull off another upset. Their defense did the best that they could, but Alabama's run it all over them, and I can tell that Wyoming gave up because they're punting it with four minutes left down by 28, so we can just conclude that they've lost to Alabama, which is unfortunate because they had an amazing run. In the end, Jalen Milrow just played well, and we gotta give props to the Cowboys for making it this far, while also congratulating Alabama for winning the first full imperialism of the 2023-2024 to season.